Thomas, what are you doing with my heart? Yeah, sorry, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I was very nervous. Good evening. Welcome to the 14th episode of the School of Resistance, an online format and platform for creating change, for discussing alternatives for the future, for the future and to create a blueprint for polit politics of resistance, which is a, hot, a lot to want and to wish for, but it's necessary. And tonight, I'm your host, Carolina Maciel de França, talking to a collective uh, Las Tesis from Chile, speaking to Nora Amin, based in Brussels, and speaking to Susan Buck Morris from the US. I will be introducing them gradually as we uh, proceed in this conversation, but I'd like to introduce today's topic to you, which is revolution today. And we'll not only be talking about today's revolutions, but also how previous revolutions have taught us to, to use politics and to use art as a as a form to uh, practice politics. So tonight we will be discussing a lot of that. Before we really start this conversation, I'd like to open up for questions. If you're watching from all over the world, you can ask questions in the chat and also email them to schoolofresistance uh, at antigent.be. I guess we are able to put the email address in the chat as well, so you can join us later with questions. For now, um, yes, for now I'd like to start by showing a video made by Colectivo Las Tesis in 2019, where they took the streets of Chile. Uh, Thomas, do you have a video for us? Excuse me, Thomas, do you have the video with sound? Scheiße. <laughs> it would be nice. I think the sound is important. I'll talk to you while, while you fix it. Maybe um, I can introduce some of the members of Las Tesis while Thomas goes and fixes the sound problem because you came, all of you, Sibila Sotomayor, Daphne Valdez, Paula Cometa and Lea Cáceres, um, thank you for joining us. And some of you uh, are translating to each other as we speak, which I think is an act of solidarity in itself. I love it. Uh, tell me, would you care to tell me a little bit more about how you got together as a collective and then how it came to the point of this video that we're going to see? And then afterwards, we'll talk more. ¿Cómo empezaron? ¿Cómo, cómo se conocieron? Yes, we started on 2019, no, 18, sorry, uh, with this idea of spreading feminist theory because we thought that in our local context, it was really urgent and really necessary to help us understand as a society uh, a lot of issues, many, many, many issues, but mostly uh, feminist issues, of course. That's very important for us. We are a feminist collective a political collective and activist collective, but mostly an artistic collective. That's uh, pretty much the place that we have chosen to fight, to do our fight through art and through these different disciplines because we come from different uh, artistic backgrounds too. 
we come from theater, from dance, from history, from social sciences, from uh, design, from uh, textile, like costume design also. Uh, so yes, what we try to do is to put all these different knowledge that we have, these different uh, methodologies that we have, uh, mat materials, languages, um, put it uh, for, for the performance, put it uh, on service for spreading these ideas, these feminist demands, these feminist theories, uh, to also express and denounce the oppressions, the violence, uh, mainly through for women, for people from the LGBTQI plus community, and of course, in the context of Chile, Valparaiso, and Latin America. Mm -hmm. And uh, with that in mind is that we start working little pieces in a small format so it could be adaptable. So we can could show it on theater, but also on electronic parties, like in raves, in, in the street, in universities also as a panel, you know, like everywhere. We really believe in the, this idea of adapting our work. And that's how in the context of 2019, there was this big uprising in our country. And we decided to go to the street with one little piece of one of our performances that uh, denounced sexual violence, but specifically to dedicate it to the police in our country because of all this uh, denounce of um, political sexual violence from them in this context of big social uprising that we were living. Thank you, Sibila. So I, as I understand, you're artists from and, and um, intellectuals from different disciplines, and you just gathered your means of communication and unified around your femininity to, to, to pressure um, the outside through, world. Through feminism, more, more than femininity. To, through feminism, yes, correction. and through a methodology that is collage. For us, what we do is a, a performance collage. Like all the, these little languages, there's not a hierarchy of one uh, from another. Like everything is in the same uh, importance because we think that people learn from different uh, ways, not only through the words, you know, like the speaking words, but also through body, through the visual, mm -hmm. etc. And this specific uh, piece of performance that is now ready for us with sound, it uh, takes place on the streets as I, uh, I saw it before, and it has a very specific text to it. I'm not sure if we should uh, listen to it first and then translate. Yes, maybe. Let's go, uh, Thomas, if you want. El patriarcado es un juez que nos juzga por nacer y nuestro castigo es la violencia que no ves. El patriarcado es un juez que nos juzga por nacer y nuestro castigo es la violencia que ya ves. 
congratulations. I don't know about you, but I'm, uh, I have, I have uh, the goosebumps all over. It's so powerful to hear this message, this message through the voice of so many women. And also, how was it for you to, because you started in Chile in Valparaiso maybe, but this traveled the whole of the world. Um, it will never stop to surprise us first because it it, it keeps it keeps on showing that the power of art and introducing that kind of knowledge to your body to body language and to different um, ways of expression and it can it can show you the, the force of the world how women and how the power of feminist it's going it's it's like you can feel it on your body because you are related with that pain and so or you're related with that awful things that society had taught you to think so it's quite um it will never never stop impressing us because it's it's art in his own way doing his stuff <laughs> maybe it will it will never cease impressing as as long as there's still the oppression that we recognize um, Nora, Nora Amin, you're an author, performer, theater director, choreographer, and you founded your own um, theater group, um, La Musica Inde Independent. You also use your body and your politics on feminism, not femininity, as a basis of your work. And what intrigued me when I read your bio was that you uh, use uh, the theater of the oppressed by Augusto Boal uh, to, as a method, um, and you translated it to the Egyptian, Egyptian context, as I understood correctly. How did you do it? How did you find this? How did you come across this Brazilian method and find it useful for your own context? And how do you include feminism in that story as well? A very big question. I know I, I, I love big questions. By, I want to start by thanking and cheering for what we saw and really uh, recognizing this kind of uh, global sisterhood. And I feel it is not uh, just um, struggle against patriarchy and sexual violence, it's a struggle for freedom and equality. And I think the women have to be the leaders of this fight. There is no other way. Uh, for my story with Theater of the Oppressed, I met with Augusto Boal. I was uh, the translator of one of his books from French to Arabic. This is how it started. We developed a friendship. He became also my mentor. I traveled to Brazil and I trained there with him and with his team and later with Barbara Santos. And then um, uh, I started working with the method in 2011. Before I tried to make workshops, but it was um, impossible to spread on a large scale. And it was impossible to implement in the outdoor sphere, public sphere, mm -hmm. exactly because it is based on exchange, equality, participation, and the criticism of the oppressive mentality. So, of course, it was banned by the oppressive system, of course, as all the outdoor uh, performing arts were forbidden under the emergency law of Egypt until 2011. And this makes us understand how performing arts out sphere, like what we did now, what we saw now, is already a protest, at least in the mentality of dictatorships whatever is performed by the people and from their own perspective becomes a kind of protest and live demonstration, even if it is just a simple play about a girl who is beaten up by her father and deprived from going to school. This was uh, our main starting performance with Theater of the Oppressed in Egypt in 2011. And it was happening in the context of uh, transformation. At that point, everybody felt that the barrier of fear was taken down. 
And when fear is removed, our minds can think more critically and more freely. And with the barrier of fear also falling off, it was a possibility to understand the togetherness because fear is a tool to prevent us from feeling this togetherness. In this togetherness, also the discrimination between genders is falling apart even temporarily, maybe only temporarily. And then we can see in the image of the uh, girl Samah, uh, the heroine of our theater of the oppressed story, we can see in her every Egyptian citizen whether male or female. We can see in the subjugation of the young female child, a subjugation of the Egyptian citizen that have been uh, infantilized. There is a continuous infantilization for women across history, across patriarchal systems, as much as there is an infantilization of the citizens under dictatorships. Uh, in our story, I just will mention this, the last thing, so not to talk too much. Um, many of the spectators are going on stage and replacing the character of Samah and trying to negotiate possibilities uh, uh, for justice so that they are not beaten up, they are not deprived from education. This happens by talking, by negotiating the conflict and the oppression. And it was amazing to see male spectators replacing the character of a female with all the history of shaming of a man playing the role of a woman. This happened and this was a proof that there is something changing. But there was also the idea, the consensus that the spectators understand the character of the father as being uh, the ruler, the president, the dictator. So it was an immediate equivalence between fatherhood, patriarchy, and political rule. And if we need to find the new governance systems that are based on equality, we need to dismantle this patriarchal figure. Because we are not only ruled by political regimes, we are ruled by patriarchal political regimes. This I understood also with the spectators throughout our performances. Can you, can you elaborate on the latter? Maybe for me, um, I, I want to stick with this sentence that you said, that the distinction that you made, and I want to understand it better. It's, it's, it's almost as if I'm looking for this moment where the audience in itself through dialoguing realizes that the oppressor is, is the form of this professor, the oppressor of, of this metaphor. Of course, uh, in, in, in the sense of watching the father figure in this kind of hierarchy and supremacy, we understand through the uh, discussion and the improvisation with the actors, of course, that the father feels totally entitled to inflict pain, to control and to um, rule the house because all the subjects in the house, the wife and the children and the daughter, they are owned by him. They are not owned by their own selves. They don't own their bodies. They are ownerships, properties of the father. Oh, yes. And in this exact situation, you can see the parallel with uh, oppressive or dictatorship systems thinking that the governing body owns the country and the citizens are just part of this ownership. It's also a way to um, uh, disappropriate the land and the country from the citizen and make it appropriated by the government system. So that when we revolt, we are actually reclaiming our identity as citizens. Yes, this to me, res sorry, it resonates to me. Yes, finish please. Uh. Very quickly, there was uh, a woman spectator who suggested in her um, improvisation to kill the father. 
And, and she suggested that the whole family should cooperate together to kill the father because the father is already a kind of killer. And for her, this was also applicable for the uh, political situation now uh, that we should liquidate whoever tortured us. And this very critical moment was exactly getting to the core of culture of the oppressed. We do not need to recycle torture. We do not need to recycle oppression. Otherwise, we also become an oppressor like the father. And then the bigger question, then how to move on? And, and how to find forgiveness? How to find justice if we cannot forgive? And how to find forgiveness if we don't have justice? I just opened more topics, I'm sorry. Yes, I love this doc box of Pandora here. Um, I'm, I love summari summarizing a little as well, just to be sure that I completely understood your line of thought, which I think is great. So you mentioned the, the, the child figure, figure is also a metaphor for the infantilization that I also see happening with women that we also saw in the video by Lastesis, where women are actually fighting back to appropriate their own bodies. And when you think of situations of, of enslavement, then it's also about the disappropriation of not land, but of bodies that then settles the oppressor. And uh, this, uh, I think, is a nice, before I come back to you, I will, I will certainly come back to everybody, but maybe to introduce Susan, Susan Buckmores, who is, uh, who is here with us tonight as a political professor in political science and uh, Susan your book um, that you published in 2019 is called revolution today just like today's talks what do you study in this book do you do you analyze revolutions of today do you do you analyze uh, relations between oppressors and oppressed people or groups that are tired of it have you, do you have conclusions that were met here or already in this, in, in the video that we saw in the talks? Well, maybe can you introduce the book or the, the analysis you made? Um, thank you so much. I, I, I will talk a little bit about it, but mainly I want to say that the book, which uh, the last picture I got into it, it it's a short book, a hundred pages, a hundred images. And almost every page is an image of a demonstration taking place since 2011. Uh, so it's kind of this, this constant, constant um, global willingness to, to perform in public space a different kind of society. And it's really extraordinary. It has no, uh, um, there's no, uh, spatial hierarchy here. This happens all over the world. The last picture I got into the book was Sudan in uh, 2019. Uh, but since that time, I've been collecting pictures from uh, Myanmar or from um, uh, Hong Kong or from uh, Chile or from, uh, you know, all over the world. You can't stop collecting these. It becomes a huge archive. But what I want to just say thank you for inviting me to this because it gave me an opportunity to find out more about Nora's work and to find out uh, uh, Las Tesis's uh, work and particularly this wonderful, wonderful uh, video. Uh, um, and, and to know that you have been working with, uh, uh, in, in, in a kind of solidarity with pussy riots, which I knew from work I had done in the Soviet Union. Uh, so you see these connections happening and I, I want to use my time just to say what strikes me, I had one image in the book, which for me is just crucial. And it is one you, I'm sure, all know. It came, I think, from Spain in 2011, from Madrid. La revolución será feminista o no será. The revolution will be feminist or it will not be. And uh, it, it seems to me that, that uh, if you really uh, you take that to heart, you know, what that means, uh, it's the end of an entire um, model of revolutionary work. So, you know, in my book, I'm still thinking about 
national revolutions. I'm still thinking about the, the history of revolutions through the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution. The word revolution has changed. The, the whole idea of the spatial, the spatial arena of revolution has changed. Everything has changed. And if you keep at the center uh, the feminist uh, impulse, then suddenly pieces come together in a totally new direction. And so, I mean, it was just extremely exciting to prepare <coughs> today. And um, what has been a problem, it seems to me, until this moment is the kind of separation of the critique of precarity from the critique of uh, you know, uh, racism from the critique of something else and something else. And suddenly all these pieces are fitting together. Uh, and I mean, you, you begin to get different, different definitions, like take the word democracy, right? Democracy has nothing to do with the history of the term. It has to do with the fact that the majority of the people in the world are women. The majority of the people in the world live a precarious economic life. And the majority of the people in the world are not white. So we're talking about a majority that, that is a totally different majority from what it would be inside of a nation state you know, idea of politics. So, so that's the first word, but also revolution. What is a revolution? Uh, it just can't be. One thing that's very important is the whole idea of stagism is gone. That's been a critique of neocolonialism. But when you put that together with, uh, the feminist demand, then you get this uh, um, interlocking of a neo-colonial critique with, uh, well, actually not, not only the feminist demand, but the feminine led uh, movement of Black Lives Matter in the United States. Then the, uh, uh, the Afro-American history in the United States suddenly becomes a global discussion, right? It's no longer uh, wedded to the, to one country, but it becomes part of the anti-colonial uh, movement. That's, that's extraordinary uh, that that connection can be made. And um, what you do, Las Tesis, and I just love it, I, you can't not dance to this, uh, this video. Uh, you, you have to do it. And uh, uh, the, the beauty of it is that police violence of Black Lives Matter and police violence uh, against women in the sense of not recognizing, of protecting the violator in the home, i.e. the patriarch, whatever, and also protecting uh, the, uh, or, or violating women who are in public space in terms of their, uh, the, their handling by the police, that these things come right together. Uh, and there's no, there's, there's an absolute analogy. There's an absolute fluid, fluidity of moving from one kind of movement to another. And it's no longer about assimilation. You know, it's, it's not about joining the majority of your country. It's about a, a, a totally different idea of sisterhood or uh, 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 collaboration, uh, which is global in scope. And then the other thing that I think is so beautiful, I had some images, but we don't have time to show them. But so, I mean, somehow or other, the rainbow, the rainbow coalition, uh, it's not just about LGBTQ uh, solidarity. It is about that, but it's about more than that. Because uh, what we see is that there's, uh, there's a beautiful piece of street art in uh, um, in the Gezi uh, Istanbul demonstration where a, a, a set of city streets is painted in rainbow, every step is a different color. And you realize that what it actually means is that there's a collaboration of movements that have different, different colors, different identities, different, uh, of, they're diverse. The whole movement is diverse. It's not about the working class or even women, you know. And so this whole either or, or the other, the whole structuring of knowledge uh, begins to, dis, you know, to destabilize and, and become just a proliferation of uh, possibilities. So suddenly, uh, as someone who I suppose has to call herself a theorist, um, uh, these uh, 
these um, manifestations are actually um, uh, creative of uh, 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 being able to see the problems of theory in a totally different way. So uh, I, I, uh, I think my book is already very much old fashioned. It's 2019 and we've gone, you know, light years since that. So, okay, okay. Uh, but I have a new book <laughs> and the new book is year one. And actually it's about the first century and it's more like what's going on right now than the one from 2019. So um, anyway, I, I'll stop. I, I like the fact that you, that you started with um, pointing out how important it is for movements and protests to be intersectional. So not only, for instance, if I would have to choose between a protest or a feminist protest and an anti-racist, I would rather go to one and solve all those problems at once because they affect me intersectionally. It's not that I am disembodied from my feminine uh, uh, identity when I suffer racism or, or anything. So I think that's already a, a progress we made from the first um, wave of feminism where we, some of you may know the, the example of Sojourner Truth, a black woman who was denied um, full access to a feminist movement, one of the first. So I think that is already something very important that you point out, uh, Susan, uh, that these movements are starting to converge and actually discerning the commonality of the oppressor, which I think is what Nora um, pointed out so well, that the oppressor is very um, uh, equal in his ways of oppressing, in his ways of infantilizing uh, women and, and children and people of color and then placing himself, um, speaking of him or the power itself as the savior of all these. Uh, so yes, yes. And this leads me to the next question, because also uh, minding the, the thing on feminism and femininity that we talked about, is that uh, nowadays here in Belgium, situating the, the, the situation here in Belgium, the word activism is, is becoming tainted somehow people are mistaking this idea of active citizenship, which is you taking to the streets to revolt whenever it's necessary, to a, an idea that is, oh, I don't want to be an activist. Um, I don't want, people here don't want to be called activists because it's somehow the, the oppression is also there on the word level of not being able to call yourself an activist, especially as an artist. So how, how does it play in your contexts, uh, Las Tessis and Nora, and how do you then extrapolate it to theory, Susan? So maybe starting with the, the performing artists, how do you deal with this, this tension of being uh, engaged in your work with politics, but also meeting this, um, this idea of activism being an insult when you're... Do you see this idea in your practice or is it just a European kind of, it could be very European, huh? The distinction. Who do you want to start with? Oh, you already started. <laughs> Please continue. I, I experienced this uh, a distinction or prejudice towards activism from people who are very clear about what everything is. So they have clear definition what performance is, what politics is, this is that and this is this, they cannot overlap. And, and I find this uh, not natural or realistic. And for me, I cannot distinguish uh, activism outside of any cultural and creative practice. Because in our practices, if we meet issues of injustice, discrimination, uh, subjugation, oppression, we have to deal with it, we have to fight back. And this is a form of activism. Any conscious action that we take during whatever practice we do is activism. 
Uh, now, if, if we come to some specific contexts of the performing arts, uh, I can say like, for instance, in Egypt or in Africa or maybe in the Arab region, I do not think it is possible to practice performing arts and creatively without being activist because we have to face a history of coloniality, colonialism. We have to face a history also of the state manipulating any form of expression. We have to face censorship. <laughs> we have to face also uh, corruption and abuse in many forms. So if we need to continue, we need to actively defend ourselves. We need to defend our existence. Also within societies that consider arts and performance as a luxury or as mere entertainment or as unnecessary. So we need also to be active and activist uh, in the way to um, like uh, claim uh, our right to decide our profession and our uh, principles of thinking. In some societies, there is a very conservative and religious thinking. We need to be activists there if we want to practice the arts, especially as women. So I feel the activism is everywhere and since ever. Um, whether it is mixing with uh, political actions of protest or not, this is another question, maybe a more developed question. And for me, I think of maybe the Egyptian stage being a, a microcosm of the oppressive system for a long time. I think that the uh, stage um, before trying to contribute to the activism of the society, it needs to revolutionize itself first. So I would say we need a revolution for the stage before we expect from the stage to support the revolution in society. The revolution in society is much faster than in the arts and in theater. Theater is still very much controlled again by patriarchy, by capitalism, <laughs> and very much by the colonial thinking that performance is this. You have to be uh, acting in a specific way. The lights have to be in a specific way. The women have to act in a specific way and be resigned to their objectification and to a certain tone of voice. If you dismantle this, if you go on the street, no, this is folklore. It's folk art. It's not theater. If you do a protest in the street with song and movement, ah, this is not performance. It is just a demo. Well, it is much more of an honest and true performance than anything on stage that is manipulated and deformed. And uh, for me, I feel it's it's one thing. Um, yeah, or maybe also because of being with this tradition, uh, in the Arab countries, in Egypt, also in the Muslim societies, where if you want to do performance, you are definitely an activist <laughs> to make it happen mm -hmm. and to make it last. And also not to uh, be instrumentalized by the regime, because you can very well be working for the state theater in the national theater, but be instrumentalized. And I don't think this is something any of us wants. I see, you've just I pointed out how it, how it can also infantilize as a sector. Sorry, Lastasis. I, I think Please. that Nora, it, it's quite clear because as for us as a group, we can't um, see like activists is not part of art or part of being a political body in the street. We think it's all mixed together. I think too, if persons are afraid of that word, it's maybe they have to um, and like put up the lights because something wrong is going on over there. We're all, as human, we're always activating, not only with our bodies, of, with our language and our ideas and our territory, um, with information, with music, Activism is, is a powerful world, word. It's a word that 
makes you realize what is your purpose in this life, in this tangent life that we are having. So I think it comes from a very privileged list, privileged, privileged um, position to say that activism is frightening people or it's a word that you want you don't want to be related. I think it, um, I think art in his profound way is always looking to activate us. So I think it's kind of if somebody else will like think or be afraid of this word word, I think. You have to be more profound. You're not seeing more profoundly things. So Leah, could we, I'm, I'm looking for a, a sentence to, to sum up what you just said um, together with Nora. Like something like activism is only, um, a, 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 some, some kind of luxury if you're in the position of doing nothing. So when you're when you speak from this urgency that you both spoke about, I don't know. We don't didn't go into the the Chile revolt side. I don't know if there'll still be time, or I should just point people out to Wikipedia. Susan recently said that most of the world are mm -hmm. being in the opposite part of color and racial difference part. Yes. Um, we don't have that amount of money. If we um, see to it in our um, in our part of the world that is Latin America, we are more oppressed. And so if you can't um, realize that that oppression body that is making an activist, it's something frightening is because you are in a privileged way. You're not thinking that the most part, the majority of the world are being oppressed and they need to be free by expressing themselves at the way they, 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 they just do it. So they, they realize their body will do it. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. And and as to um, this thing that we shortly mentioned here about when do you choose uh, to go on the streets or when do you choose or oh, this is I'm, I'm going to keep this performance to to work on for several months and then perform in a black box. Um, does it have to do with? Well, the obvious one is here impact. Um, but I'm guessing maybe the question is more when you choose the black box, when you when do you do it? Because it seems to me from what we've, we are speaking of now that the streets are more powerful anyway. So when you find yourself in a black box context within a, uh, an institution, how do you then use your protest? La pregunta un poco es cómo cuando adaptamos nuestro trabajo no solamente a la calle, que quizás la calle tiene un contexto de protesta como mucho más concreto, como que evidentemente hay una mayor potencia que en un teatro, pero qué pasa con nuestro activismo, con nuestra lucha cuando, por ejemplo, estamos en un teatro, cuando nos enfrentamos a un espacio más tradicional. Thank you, Sibila. Por lo menos en nuestro caso viene de la idea de... Eh, sembrar estas ideas feministas en todas partes y si bien aquí al menos ir al teatro es, es un privilegio porque es difícil acceder para todas las personas eh, para nosotras es importante estar ahí también pero también estar en la calle pero también estar en lugares de trabajo comunitario o en todas partes porque la idea es que estas ideas se esparzan por todas partes Yes, what Daphne is saying that for us is pretty much what we discussed first, like every place is a valid place for us to spread these ideas, to spread these demands, to denounce these oppressions. So if we have to do it in a theater, we're going to do it anyway, even if in our country, go to the theater is a privilege. It's not cheap. Well, generally when we work, we, we, we mainly have shown our work in activities that are for free, even in theaters. But mm -hmm. still, we are always open to the possibility to adapt our work to any place. And we think that all places are equally important because you can reach different people. In the theater, you're going to reach some kind of people. On the street, another kind of people. On a community center, another kind of people, etc. And the idea here is always to 
to spread and to uh, generate um, community, to generate a collectivity where we can find each other, when we can relate to each other. And that's pretty much what we think happened when, for example, we see this performance replicated in so many different cultures, is that we are relating. So what we saw in that moment, right now I'm talking, not what Daphne says, I'm, I'm just adding something, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, what we, we can see now is that there's clearly like this underground network, feminist network that is everywhere, that is connecting us through our bodies, through our testimonies, through our experiences, even if we have never meet, met each other, if, even if we have never spoke to each other, we are connected because of all what Susan and Nora also says, because patriarchy is everywhere. This fight is a global fight. In another talk, we were uh, with an Indian activist and she said, if the problem is global, the solution must be global too. And we really believe in that and that there is a power of collectivity of this feminist collectivity that, as you said, um, is um, made by different subjectivities. It's not only women, uh, but it's crossed by race, but class, but gender, but by sexuality, because there's so many oppressions that we share. So we really believe in the power of this collectivity uh, where uh, we can, uh, for one moment, even sometimes forget our individual problems and be part of some, something greater, some, something bigger. That is, it's like you fight for, for your own oppressions, but you fight alone someone that has other oppressions and together you fight for all these oppressions. And that's something that we really believe in and we really believe also in this, um, in the way to do it is through one way, art, through performing arts. That's the, the, the place that we have chosen. That's why for us also being called activist will never be an insult. <laughs> it's like, of Take course, it it's like says, yes, like you can, yes. you can uh, make a division like, ah, this is my artistic face. This is my act. No, everything is mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. and the, the, you're re really true to your statement when you say that you're dedicated to this disseminating feminist theory through performance. And when I saw your performance, the, 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 uh, the cool one, uh, El Violador Eres Tu, is when the sentence, with the sentences that you give, especially when they're translated, they give women throughout the world hand, um, like ready, made slogans to react to other oppressions. So it's actually really a tutorial video of how to respond to, and that way the, the other uh, insult often heard in the Western performing arts sector is that um, activist art would be too, too direct and too not abstract. And in a way you prove them wrong by showing how El violador es tú is powerful through being so concrete, through being so, how you say, relatable um, and so direct as actually uh, a way to, I wrote down art as a way to inspire and gather a crowd and to make a mob to actually enlarge in your group of uh, aware feminists. Um, so I thank you for that. I, I know I know it's um, uh, I I know from experience because I was born in a patriarch uh, country next to yours, so I've had to deconstruct a lot of of things that we were learned as as children, um, all of us I think. So uh, maybe a question for those of you who studied several uh, revolts and uprisings uh, around the world. What has been the most, what has been something very powerful that we can just copy paste into other contexts and what has been working globally and what can we take um, further around the world to do this? As we have this, we now, we now know that our common, uh, our oppressor is common. He's the same throughout the world. Just now the exchange of tactics and methods in the sisterhood. Yes, please, Sarah. I, I, I wanted to say, uh, um, when you mentioned the word abstract, 
of course, our actions and expressions in the street, in demos and protests, they are anything but abstract. And uh, in the Western performance and theater, there is this um, goal of abstraction, yeah? The, the more you are uh, developed and brilliant, the more abstraction you can make. So it keeps abstracting, 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 until it, it, it loses its own flesh and bone. You don't find the smell and the senses and the breathing and the temperament. And if danger. Temperament, then and the danger as well. Dangerous. Yeah. It's aggression. It's aggressive. And um, I feel if we really, I mean, for myself as a, as a like a choreographer, or a performer, and everything, I, I would like to learn from the street actions, from the protests, something to develop and decolonize the stage. So if we look at it there is really a kind of universal language of movement and of expression, a kind of gestuality, a kind of uh, uh, communication. There, there is the borders also between the people, they are not so much there. I, I would like to learn how the body can be so well rooted and also so much uh, powerful from the expressions of the body, the, the movements of the body and the being, the, the corporal being that is also um, uh, embedded in emotionality and in a sense of dignifying this togetherness from a protest, how to find a way to learn from this for the stage and especially for the embodiment of women on stage, how to change this universal tradition of how women are portrayed and embodied on stage and what the female body means and what the female sexuality means. And also uh, from the communication and dynamics uh, between the people uh, in a protest, in a revolution, we learn a different kind of spectatorship. So we lived for a long time with a kind of division. Huh? Here the performer, here the spectators, those are watching, they are silent, they are passive, and the stage has the discourse. And, but when you are together in a demo or protest, everybody is performer and everybody is spectator. And we watch each other while we do what we do. And this uh, barrier doesn't exist. There is also... Um, like a kind of moving away from this separation of who holds the center or the focus. You have to be multi-focused and you have to employ your senses and your heart and not only your mind. There is big space for empathy and I feel also big potential for healing. And it's a kind of healing that goes through the pain if we really want to find the healing, we have to go through the pain. There is no other way to make it happen. So this also, I think we can learn uh, for the stage. I love talking to you all. Ah, me too. I'm, I'm suddenly becoming very uh, fluent in expressing myself, which is not so often. And also the smile of Carolina. So yes, I've, I've, I'm, I've been set to encourage people. So I'm right here. Uh, Please continue. I'm the one who should be checking the time. I'm not, but I should. I'm done. No, no, but um, I, I wanted to talk. As you were speaking of the stage, I, I also realized that the, the peripheral view, women's view, are much broader than a men's. So we have this wider view. Um, it spoke to me about your multi focality and the points and I had this question for Susan in, in the on the back of my mind since you talked about your book being uh, full of photos maybe do you have a memory of how is there something similar in all these photographs of revolts people revolting is that something that stands out 
to you as being very particular to that kind of context or, or very unfamiliar in that kind of context. That could be some kind of answer to Nora's uh, search for um, the corporality of a protest, if I may call it that way. Uh, well, I think I answer one, one word, women. Hmm. Women are in this these photos, you know, and uh, you know my thanks are to all the all the people in the photos, and it, the the uh, the taking to the streets has been uh, uh, overwhelmingly uh, led by women, not in one country but across the world. It's really quite striking. But you know, uh, Carolina, I want to pick up on uh, on something you said, which was that in a certain sense the. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, the video that we saw is a tutorial video for the world. I think that's really quite beautiful because uh, again, I'm a pedagogue. I'm, I'm, I'm a pedagogue, uh, but um, we need a new kind of pedagogy. Uh, and uh, the idea that something like this uh, teaches others, uh, I, I think it's also totally interesting that Nora has found um, uh, the. Uh, the calling of street performance folk art by those who would prefer to keep it an elite uh, 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 practice. The old questions used to be, you know, like Benjamin's uh, aestheticization of politics, politicization of art, as if these two things were in conflict or whatever. But I think that's that's also uh, been transformed. Uh, and part of this is the new technology. The media that are possible uh, make for a kind of convergence of politics and performance, performance and art, art that's not art, but is, as, as Nora says, about an aesthetics, an aesthetics of the body, an aesthetics of rhythm, an aesthetics of song, whatever. This is, uh, this is not totally new in history, but the way it's uh, performing a, an epistemological break in the whole tradition of what radical politics is supposed to have been is really important. I was going to say that it's non-instrumental politics, but I think to myself, isn't it true, you uh, uh, wonderful people from Chile, that uh, uh, you actually have a new constitution uh, as of last weekend that has been voted in. I don't know how good it is, but what I'm but I'd love to hear about that because I'm not sure that the only goal or the main goal is a transformation of national political representation. That is a goal, but there's so much more. And it's precisely to me, the, the global interrelationships. Um, uh, the, the, uh, the situation has, has radically changed. Black Lives Matter was the biggest demonstration in the United States, I think in history and its movement in other places in the world has been extraordinary. Um, and again, this was led by women. Uh, the, there is a kind of problem because it becomes anonymous. So people claim that they are Black Lives Matter in ways that are rather self-serving. And I think that's happened in some senses with Pussy Riot as well, but so what, let it be. Mm -hmm. Because there's something else going on that's more important, which is, uh, 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 I mean, this corporeal understanding of what liberation and freedom is uh, that, that Nora was talking about. And uh, uh, it's the opposite of ontology. It's the opposite of some sort of uh, essentialism, uh, even though it starts with the body or something uh, essential uh, that has been seen as essential, like race or sex or whatever. It's precisely an overcoming of those uh, uh, categories that tend to fix fix you in, in, into some um, into some box uh, that's uh, that's no different, perhaps, from the black box of the theater. Right, you, everyone's supposed to be in their place. Everybody's in their seat, and everybody's either looking or being looked at. Uh, all of this is is in enormous flux right now. It's totally exciting. But I think you 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 give me an idea of when you spoke of aesthetics. I think what we could come to a conclusion here 
maybe today is the start of the aesthetics of protesting, uh, like a sharing, um, and also the role of the internet, especially for your work, uh, Lastes is spreading so quickly throughout the whole world and being copied by so many women is actually indeed what you said, uh, Susan, due to the new technology, democrat democratizing, if it's mm -hmm. even a word, making it more democratic to, for you to broadcast and, and disseminate your message. Do you want to, to answer on Susan's question on the... Yes. Um, eh, voy a, a tomar dos ideas de, de lo que también dijo Nora, de esta um, idea de, del activismo y el arte como cosas separadas, que lo que pasa también acá en Chile es que siempre se espera que el activismo devenga de la participación eh, tuya en un partido político. Y lo que ocurrió con el levantamiento social en octubre es eh, el enfrentamiento en contra de la clase política. Entonces, mm. esa idea de, de este fenómeno también global es, eh, de, de, que, que surge desde nuestro trabajo es la idea de que el activismo eh, no solo le pertenece a los partidos políticos, eh, es una respuesta social interdisciplinaria y también no disciplinaria, entendiendo que en Chile, eh, como cualquier país subdesarrollado, eh, tiene altas tasas también de, de personas eh, analfabetas, eh, de personas no profesionales, y eso significa que todas aquellas personas, eh, desde sus quehaceres, desde sus experiencias vitales, muchas familias que no han ido a la universidad, hoy tienen una primera generación de personas, una primera persona, una hija, que ingresó a la universidad y que hoy es parte de la Convención Constitucional. Eso es el resultado del levantamiento social y del arte eh, en la calle con nosotras y con un montón de expresiones más que salieron también. Para eso. So, Paula was saying that she, she's going to take two ideas. From one point, what Nora was saying about, about how uh, some people, well, and Carolina also with her question, right? Uh, some people separate art from activism. She was telling us that in Chile, um, generally activism, uh, activism is related to political parties, for example. It's like something that's only related with people on the political parties. In Spanish, we actually made a, a, a difference. Distinction. Distinction. The, a distinction, thank you, between the political, como lo político, and la política. And la política yes. comes yes. from, like, from all these institutional politics. Yes. And the political is related to yeah. the basis, to what happened in the street. La so política what, wears a tie, and el político is, la política wears a tie in the suit. Claro. And el político is like the idea of citizenship, that you should be responsible for your own, the well-being of your own. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and what she was saying is that uh, what we saw in this uh, political uprising in 2019, now answering the question of Susan, uh, is that there was this big uprising against the political class, against the political institutionalized, against the political parties, you know. So in this moment, we can see how this. Um, espérate how these two are converging. Uh, there was something about analphabetism. Um, yeah, 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 but not yet. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. I have some notes, but I, I'm, I'm, I don't have a very good calligraphy, so then I have some problems. But she said that how this uh, global phenomenon uh, against the political class is global, as you all of you have said, said and that now allow us, at least in our country, to relate activism, not only to political parties, but to the political to the street, to artists too. 
and uh, from a point of view that is also interdisciplinary and even non-disciplinary sometimes it, like so it doesn't even relate to any disciplines and <laughs> disciplinaries right and also how all this process led us to today for example in a country where also education is private mainly yes there's been this big uprising since 2011 to try to have again a public and free education because we still don't have it so what we have seen is that there's a lot of people that don't get have access to education but today because of this political uh, big social uprising uh, we have people for example that are going to write the constitution uh, now that was just elected last weekend because the election was not for the new constitution but because of for who is going to write this constitution. People that, for example, are a first generation uh, that came uh, enter university of even people that don't have uh, a superior education. You know, so it's, it's really what we have seen is how the political parties have lost all the credibility, you know, because with this big uh, lack of representativity, uh, and we can really see a, a big demographic in that place that even if it's not representing everyone, because sadly there's a lot of different sectors of our society that didn't get to be there, uh, that wasn't chosen or because uh, of different, the system to the election was very, very weird. So yes, but still, it's still different than before. What, have we, what we have seen that not even half of that those people that are going to write this constitution come from political parties and that's something that is very important in our local history. Cometa, no sé si quería agregar algo más, perdón. I have an additional question, uh, okay. Paula, but or should I, I call you Cometa? It's much nicer <laughs> to call you Cometa, so, so please, Sibila, tell, tell us. The only little thing I wanted to add uh, because of, of what uh, Susan, I think, no, yes, was uh, talking about how body has been um, understand uh, like essentially like from gender from race or from sex even not even gender is that from our point of view of a decolonial point of view uh, we relate to some things that for example Maria Lugones says that race and gender are uh, constructions are fictions are fictional and are on service in service for the power of coloniality and that's something that is still happening today because it hasn't end clearly. We are still living in territories with colonial basis structures and oppressions and extractivism that's happening all the time in all the <laughs> spheres of our lives. True. And, and um, adding to that, Paula, maybe thank you for making the distinction, both of you, between the political and politics because I think there's a, there's a thing here in when, when we see so many protests, they are usually against uh, an, an oppressing political power. And then you, you get people who are not happy with the situation and they go and protest, but then they apoliticize, they become apolitical sometimes, which is actually a contradiction in terminus because you're doing politics by revolting, right? So um, what you're pointing out to me is that um, some, something for the toolbox or the toolkit of, of the feminist revolt or the aesthetics of protesting is also getting into, um, well, politicizing, um, wearing this badge of I am activist, I'm an activist, I am political and all these slurs, that, these things that can be used as slurs, especially in the, on the Europe, uh, being continent then, but also um, by having these same bodies portrayed in Susan's book um, become the bodies of power in institutions, which is what I hear when Paula, uh, I really would like to call you Cometa right now, uh, but Paula was commenting when she said that your new constitution is going to be written up by uh, what they call an inclusive group, uh, a more diverse group that represents more layers of the society and then has more perspectives on how it can be uh, multifocal, how, how we can then not have um, a politics of a, uh, centered on the stage 
like Nora said so, so beautifully. Um, any other? I, 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 um, I did check on the time. I said I wouldn't, but I always do. We have 20 minutes left and there are no questions as of yet from the audience. So we just get to talk and exchange strategies as long I would as... Like to say something. Please, please. Very brief regarding the multifocus. Porque Nora mm -hmm. estaba hablando del multifoco dentro de la protesta, Carolina también decía, ¿cierto? And that uh, led me to think about how uh, we actually, through this methodology of collage, are trying to get this multifocus. This idea that there's a lot going on at the same time, like very, a lot of uh, stimulus, stimulus, I don't mm -hmm. know how you say that, uh, um, simultaneously. Like the visual, the body, the the clothing, the music, the here, the, there's some samples. That, that, there's so much going on, but actually everything that's going on, uh, the way that we work it is actually repeating the same idea. So with whatever you say, you you see, you listen, whatever where your focus goes, uh, you're going to get the same information just through a different channel, and that's very important for us as performing artists too. Like this idea that we don't want to go to that abstract place, but we also don't want to go to the lit literal place. We also believe in the power of metaphor, of course. Um, we think that the political is not only in the content, but also in the shape, in the way you produce what you do, of course. That's very important for us. But we work through this collage and this uh, repetition, like repeat, 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 because we want to be sure that everyone gets the essence at least of the idea that we want to say and we think that that's probably something very inspired also in our context in our political context of protest but also in our political cultural context of Valparaíso that is a city that is full of uh, different things it's very a multifocus uh, place uh, because I don't know if, if you know how a little bit how it is but it's is a li uh, there's just a, a few streets that are flat, like next to the sea, and then the rest is only hills, 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 hills that has different shapes with little um, houses that you feel that, that are like falling down from the hills and different colors. So I think that, yes, that all these aesthetics, that is a, an aesthetics that come from the protest, but also from our territory, it's also in, in reflected in this in these uh, strategies from the performing arts. Nora and Susan, you're free to join in at any time if you have questions, otherwise I have plenty to say. Just join in when you like, whenever you like to ask questions to each other, it's possible. Can you, so, can you raise the volume a little bit? I was just saying that you can join the conversation whenever you like, uh, both you and Susan. But I have an additional question for for Las Tesis. What what are you planning to do next, for instance? Where are you taking the the demo? Are you going to do something else with it? I, do you have another secret plan already? ¿Qué estamos haciendo? Resistencia, ¿no? Adelante. ¿Qué va a ser la próxima cosa? Or is it a secret? The, no, 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 no. It's a secret. No, it's not a secret. <laughs> um, uh, we are working in a lot of things, writing, music, sounds, um, <laughs> dress code. Uh, no, okay. voy a hablar en español. Uh, <laughs> you have an amazing book, you reminded me. You have a book uh, and the sí. cover is a match, match, a match mm -hmm. box, no? De los fósforos. I was amazed by the graphics uh, of this book. It's amazing. Um, but what was the content again? <laughs> I just saw the contenido del libro de la antología. Mm. Son eh, textos um, eh, de filosofía, an, eh, de, femi eh, todo fem de feminismo. Vienen desde de enfoque feminista. Eh, también tenemos imágenes de artistas. Um, de, de la performance es una, una compilación de textos y de imágenes eh, de, de artistas y escritor, escritoras escritores 
eh, feministas. Ok, different, so different contribution, contributions mm -hmm. from um, art, feminist artists uh, and there yes, are but, texts and, and yes. photos and multidisciplinary again as you are. Ex anthology. Exactly, like from theory but also poems or theater even, uh, there's a little piece of a play of Manuel Infante, mm -hmm. uh, like pieces of art, performance, etc. Okay. Oye, y resistencia, Daphne, no? And the other thing that we were working last year and, and this year, but because of the pandemic, it's been a little bit hard, is a play that it's called Resistencia, Resistance, actually, <laughs> that it's called Resistance or La Reivindicación de un Derecho Colectivo or the Reivindication, I think, maybe, of a collective right. And it's the collective right of a life without violence of women and people from the LGBTQI plus community and also uh, the right to appear in the public space, like to be how you want to be, how you are, you know, and like really stop living with all these oppressions because of only who you are. And we inspire uh, this piece uh, by some text of Judith Butler, of Paul Preciado and Maria Lugones also that I already mentioned it. And it is a collaborative piece. So the only way to do it is with other people. So what we made is this structure that then we make a, a workshop with people in different territories. That's what we want to do because of the pandemic, we have only been able to do it like one and a half time. And then the, the, the play appears, you know, the performance. And yes, what we want to do is to do it with around 80 to 100 people. Mm -hmm. And we have only been able to do it one time because of the pandemic. And it was very powerful for us. <laughs> I'm looking forward because that it's it's so sounds so simple like the right to appear in the public space without suffering violence but it already if you really think about all the oppressions that we suffer it sounds more like a utopia it sounds utopic it sounds like it's difficult to imagine but maybe there is that's the role of art that the power of imagination and then going towards it Nora I thought of you and then um one small question. I, I thought of you when it, when Sibila talked about the embodiment and the uh, uh, the repetition, and then there was a part of the bodies. Somehow, I thought about how you mentioned this man um, in your performance, this man that became the. Uh, I think he became the symbol or the metaphor and. Some, somehow I was reminded of your performance and then uh, I, lost my, I lost my connection, but I'm back here with you. Maybe I can ask you for your next secrets or your next performances of your next ideas of embodiment of the revolution. Um, I made a performance in 2015 with Yasmin Al-Baramawi, who is a wonderful Egyptian musician. And Yasmin is one of the heroines and survivors of the gang rapes of Tahrir Square from 2012. Um, for us, this performance was for invited audience, and we tried to create a reenactment of the effect of gang rape. It was about uh, performing the trauma itself, but also about finding a kind of uh, forgiveness to that event and a kind of mutual healing with the audience. Now, I think my next and my still ongoing performance project would be this same performance, which for me is a ritual. Uh, it was a, a solo dance that I was performing and choreographing with the music played live by Yasmin on a wood. And uh, I still believe that this kind of performance, it has a lot of potential for development. And Sorry, think... Nora, is it the one that you clean the floor? It's, some, it's a red floor. Yes. Okay, yeah. It is called I Dance For You. Uh, and it is dedicated to all the women who suffered sexual violence. But we also try to focus on sexual violence as a political weapon. 
right? It has said to be one of the most efficient political uh, war weapons. Like I can find the, yes. My idea for developing and continuing with this performance is that on one hand, it is so necessary on the human level and also for uh, uh, feminist issues, but in itself, it is one tool of fueling the feeling of humanness as a bonding between the spectators and the performers. And, and this humanness goes beyond gender and can create a foundation for collective revolt and healing. And with this performance we experienced every night, we showed it that with the male spectators, they felt totally identifying with, the, with our embodiments of rape. They felt it in their body. This is what they said, because we are collecting uh, written testimonies from them after the end. And this meant that in the action, in this action of rape, there is something that can connect us all beyond our gender and destroy the patriarchal divisions that were created in terms of hierarchy and supremacy. If we get to the core of it, because the performance of it is one way maybe yeah, to trigger emotional memory and also to create live metaphors and to help spectators who maybe did not experience such sexual violence to connect to other forms of aggression and violences that they endured that makes them uh, in kinship with the survivors of uh, rape and makes us maybe understand the different aggressions we endure as political aggressions because they are meant to uh, rob us from our human dignity and, and willpower and autonomy, autonomy of being and transform us into empty vehicles that can function like objects, dehumanized. So this would be my ongoing continuous and future performance project that is inspired and fro from the revolution, but also definitely from the struggles of women um, with their bodies all the time and sexuality being considered uh, a tool and an object and weapon for political regimes and for patriarchy. For me, this kind of performance is a way to retrieve the humanness, the humanness of all of us beyond our genders and sexualities. Thank you. The word that sparked with me was integrity. I think when you when you say that men also are able to, through your performance, to identify with the violations of the violation of that integrity, then you hit something, then you make it larger than a female body. Because also uh, a lot of men are uh, uh, survivors of rape. It's much harder to speak about it, I think, I think yes. when you're a man, but yes. And if we as women have such a longer history that makes us equipped now to perform it and to protest against it, then maybe we can support our uh, fellow survivors. Uh, because for me, this is really beyond the, uh, it's beyond the gender. It's about our humanness. It's, it's a rape of the humanness. Um, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a long way to go. It's a long way to go. And also to identify that in order to create change and ongoing evolution, we have also to work with youth and with children. And in order to do this as a transformation of consciousness and pedagogy, we will need again to fight rape and abuse for children 
because even for children, it is used as a pedagogical conscious tool for subjugation. It is not a mistake. And it is part of the concept of parenthood in some places. As a parent, you can do whatever <laughs> you want to do to the child. In some places, as a husband, you own the body of your wife. So there is no rape if you are married. Yeah? Some places, rape is not even recognized as rape. But, but the core behind this is the definition of a human being, of humanness. And that the humanness cannot be owned except by the person who is the human. I was going to add autonomous humanity. Yeah. Otherwise, it, it sounds to me like a recycling of the whole history of enslavement. It's not over. It was never over. Mm -hmm. And it is still continuing. And the, and the protest against it. Susan, you had a, an addition as well. You're on mute still. Sorry. Um, it, it is a little out of uh, context right now, but maybe not so much. Um, it seems to me uh, that the role of, okay, uh, for a while I was doing a lot of writing on for artist catalogs and things like that, and it, it became so much absorbed in the art world in a way that was extremely compromising, I felt. Uh, you know, artists wanted you to write something theoretical, which would justify their art, blah, blah. And I think that um, everything that we've spoken about here is not in that category, which is very nice. Uh, and I also uh, have felt for a long time, particularly when uh, faced with a lot of uh, European theory, that uh, theory is not the place you go for a justification of art. Uh, and uh, I've been teaching Walter Benjamin, not what he says, but how. So Benjamin as method, as method. And one of the weeks is just this one phrase, I have nothing to say, only to show. Um, I think that's, uh, that was how he imagined his passage in back. Um, and I think that this idea of a collage of showing, uh, that the form of the theory is more important than the content um, is, uh, is very wise for this moment. Uh, so uh, there is no theoretical way you begin. You may use theory as you use other things in the collage of your multifocal uh, presentation, but I have nothing to say only to show uh, puts us in the in the role of the mediator, the the medium, the the relation, the midwife, the builder of relations and relationality. Another quote by you that I came across in an interview was that you said, uh, "More than meaning something, it did something." Uh -huh. I like that as well, and it, it kind of circles back to. It's the also theory. yes, it's a practice. The theory yeah. is itself a practice. The yeah. art is itself a practice. There is no first theory, then art, or first uh, political program, and then action. Uh, that that is really uh, uh, very clear and so exciting with with uh, the people who have been talking today. Yes, I am. Um... I have so many more questions for you. <laughs> I am also trying to synthesize, synthesize and summarize because I, I have this tendency of wanting to give uh, handouts in the end. But I think the most uh, important thing is that uh, this discussion about activism and citizenship, you reclaiming citizenship as a responsibility of an individual living in its context to act politically. Um, the autonomous humanity, the reclaiming of the humanity and the integrity of a human being, as opposed to the common enemy the, uh, of the patriarchy. Um, art being a tool for change. Um, the, the urgency that you feel um, as opposed to a luxury that some feel as in speaking out. 
uh, in in speaking with you, I felt this, the 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 urgency was really really uh, tingent. Really, um, I can almost touch it, but we are virtual here, so I cannot touch it. Um, and then the role of the internet, I think, in not only the, this very strong image that I have of your book, Susan, um, the photos of mostly women being on the front line of protests and um, through the, the course of history and through the course of how power was divided, I think that is uh, saying a lot about the common enemy of patriarchy and intersections but also of the, the, you remind me of who is taking power again and who should with whose perspective, which is women. Do you have things that you want to say to each other or do you want to exchange emails and ask for each other's uh, uh, <laughs> signature? Um, I, for one, I, uh, I hope we made a start here in this thing called the aesthetics of protesting. I hope you never uh, are asked again if you want to choose between your disciplines and methods, because I think you shouldn't, you, you proved to me. Uh, so if none of you want to speak and none of the audience have questions, I'm going to check. No, it's just translating. I think we should keep these translate translations to uh, to Spanish for <laughs> for your next anthology but so no if you don't do you have anything to say to each other um, si tenemos algo que decirnos entre nosotras ahora como después de compartir for me just sending a lot of love very honored to have been among you today Oh. Yes, for, it's, it's been an honor to share ideas that it's so important to really realize how are we meeting this very big um, social um, kind of new system of how we are getting together. It's, uh, it's quite amazing. Thank you for the time and for the opportunity. It's been very nice. Mm -hmm. I think. Thank you. Thank I'd you. like to thank all the partners, Antigens, Academia de Kunste, IIPM, Howl, Round Theater, Kulturstiftung, um, and many others to gather up this amazing bunch of experts on change. Um, and I was very honored to be here to mediate this conversation and to learn in the first place. I'm always learning and then mediating and learn from the knowledge that you share. And also, I must say, it gives so much power to be connected with you, albeit through the internet, but it gives so much power to connect with uh, women and, um, and people who are uh, holding on to the struggle, I might say. So thank you for that. Thank you, Carolina. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Shokram. Thank you. Gracias. The live stream is over. We are offline. Yay. <laughs> but a quick thank you uh, off screen as well. You did a wonderful job.